Hello and welcome back. It's good to be back and it's been so encouraging to get all your notes and your thoughts and um, some of the conflicting opinions and uh, it's been it's been great. I really enjoyed it and I do hope it means that you have enjoyed it and you're just enjoying going along as uh, we all sit at home rather bound up and not, uh, you know, cabin fever is real and alive. And on this uh, Easter, it's very strange for all of us. So uh, I can only wish you all a benevolent Easter. Let's hope. Stay safe. Right, let's get on with our story. Last week, we were talking about King Mzilikasi and how he moved away from Chaka, of course, and how he went through. Now, I have to say that he was absolutely extraordinary in his discipline. Last week, we spent quite a bit of time talking about his interrelationship with, with Moffat. And it showed really how fascinated he was by what was happening outside his world. And in all of that, it became terribly important to try and show that Mfekani which really was the cleaning out of all the tribes of the Northern Transvaal, to show it in context and to show the movement of other people as, as it all happened. And part of that equation, of course, was Moffat and the fact that his mission was based down at the bottom end of what was then Bachwanaland and is now Botswana. And he... His, one of his first converts was Kama, King Kama II. He became a Christian and he immediately swung into action and he said to all his men, you will no longer have any more than one wife and we will no longer sell alcohol to the Tswana people. Well, he was not a very popular chap, as you can imagine, but he was a wise and great king, undeniably so. There was a British administrator in Tswana land, as it was then, and one day Kama looked at what was happening with the Batibidi, and he went to the British administrator and said, these guys are coming, we cannot fight them, what can we do? And he was advised to ask for protection from Britain. That he did, and he, they became a British protectorate, which meant effectively that the chiefs still took charge of everything, the British provided a basic administrative backup, and the main thing was uh, a peacetime police and military presence to make sure that the Matebele did not come as far as Botswana, or present-day Botswana. Interestingly, both Northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland, nice today Zambia and Malawi, were also British protectorates. But of course we, as Rhodesia, today Zimbabwe, were self-ruling colony, a very different kettle of fish. Right, let's go back to King Kama, to the Bechuana people, and to the movement of King Mzilikazi across the Northern, Terri uh, Northern Transvaal. Now, how on earth one does that? with the discipline required to move an increasing number of people from 2,000 when he left southern Mozambique to 20,000 estimated when he crossed the Limpopo. And of course those estimates vary. You have to take what you think is the nearest possible to it from the oral history and all the various accounts, all of which are told from a vested interest perspective, of course. But a very large number of people. The discipline had to be very tough. Otherwise it would just get unruly and out of hand. When you don't have the democratic principles that we have, very hard to rule that. And then the basic things like making sure there was enough food, making sure that there were sufficient tribes around to go and get more cattle when you needed them. And how did you manage things like sewage? Well, I don't know why I thought of it, but it happens. And I mean, you know, 20,000 people, that's a lot of sewage. So I just happened to come across one day a very interesting tribe called
called the Bakwena people. Now the Bakwena were Tswana, they're part of that wider group of many Tswana tribes, and they were just north of the Machalisberg range. The interesting thing was they'd been there for a long time. Their villages were well established, beautifully built, well painted in terracottas and reds and whites and turquoise colours, quite, quite different from anything else that was operating at that particular time. Round about the same time, I came across a character called Jan Krutwurm. Jan Krutwurm, and he looks like a, a Corsa. Who is this man? Well, I couldn't find out, and nobody could tell me. Every single thing, every time he popped up, and he pops up here, and he pops up there, and then there. Jan Krutwurm. First of all, he was a driver, teaching missionary Helm how to speak Sindebele on the three months it took them to drive from the Cape up to Matabililand. Another occasion, he was working on behalf of Karma. Another one, he was working on behalf of the British. Another, he was working on behalf of the Matabele. But nobody's ever made those links. I've never found a book about Jan Frutbom. Why did he have an Afrikaans name? Well, we had to find some mechanism to introduce Jan Krutwurm. So I put the Bakwena and a young Jan Krutwurm together and uh, all sorts of things started to happen. So let's just have a look and see. Our village was one of the biggest of all the Bakwena villages. This is Kuda, who is the father of one of the characters in the book. There was panic one day, around 1830, as Mzilikasi's Matibele Impi were coming. But the king had heard we were different. An unusual village that lived in the same place for many generations. He was interested. From a distance, he waited and he watched. He came to talk to us and he asked if he could move one of his small regiments of Impi in to live in the village with us. And King Zilikasi came and lived with us for many months. He was always asking questions. He was impressed with our big airy houses and our painted walls. He wanted to know why our people were so strong and so healthy, why the Bakwena didn't fight other tribes to get their cattle, and why they still had big herds. He was asking questions all the time, again and again. Some of our headmen were invited to see his new capital. They came back saying, hey, it was bigger than anything they had ever seen. In a big circle with the royal family in the middle and then the meeting area, which was called the Bokkrau. But they said the houses were terrible. They were made of grass and they had no smoke holes. So the smoke was inside and you had to bend in half to get through the doors. They were not very good, those houses. But Baba, they're still not very good, said Timba. Timba, some of them are very good nowadays. You must not say these things. He did say one special thing was that our Bakwena village had a good way of getting rid of ha, sewage. Everybody had to dig a shallow trench, which was just a bit higher than the main trench, which connected with the other trenches. Then waste from people and from animals was pushed down the trench, and the young boys collected it at the other side to dry it so it could go on for millet crops. Pooh! Timber made a face. Didn't it smell? I wouldn't like to be the one collecting that sewage, Baba. Kuda laughed. What do you think the floors of the huts in Cholocho are made of? Timber. I don't know. They are shiny and polished. They are dung. They are dried and mixed up and then they are spread on the floor and polished. The Matyabele and the Nguni people have been doing this for generations. Wonderful floor, shiny, 
Smut, there's no snow. Did you collect the dump? From the trenches yourself as well, Baba. Ah, yes, a bit of it, but not all of it, because some were used to make a compost to put onto our apoko and our millet to make them grow. And then the missionaries gave us some seeds, so we used to grow vegetables for them, and then they would buy them. The village was so clean, there was never any sickness. So Mzilikatsi watched the herds of fat cattle and goats and asked questions about why we gave them so much extra food and why they bred so many fat calves and why we had it them in that way. He was so interested in why we ploughed the fields for our apoko and our millet as well as growing the vegetables for the missionaries. But perhaps most of all, he was amazed that we had been in one place for more than 30 years. He was our friend. His people mixed with our people. Wow, Bob, I've always heard that him silicates killed everybody, unless they were Amandebele. Well, one night, they were no longer our friends. And I have to say the poor Bakwena people suffered almost more than any other tribe in that whole northern Transvaal area. There's some wonderful writing by Moffat about what he found following all of that. But from that, I've been able to create a lovely character who becomes Jan Hutwin. We had to build a mystique around this man because he was just so extraordinary. Now, while all this was going on, of course, the Matebele were under com considerable strain from the Boers. The Boers did not like the British, who were taking over far too much authority where they came from. They just wanted to get away from them and find their own piece of land at the same time that the Matebele were saying, we want our piece of land. And we're never to be going to be crashes. So as the Great Trek came through, in 1836, there was a big trek, which was looked after by the Potkis, known as the Potkit of Trek, made up of several families, all moving up together, lagering at night, protecting themselves, lots of battles with the Matavir. But they had reached the Val, and they had been promised they could cross the Val as soon as Potkita went and talked to the king. He hadn't yet done so, and one particular family called the Liebenbergs, for some unknown reason, decided to cross in advance of the rest. They crossed at dead of night, trying to get the cattle through the river with all those crocodiles and things quietly. Not easy. They had just got the wagons, they got everything through the river, they were just outspanning the cattle, and of course the Matabili attacked. And they killed everybody. Or at least they thought they did. But seven children escaped. Four of them were found wandering in the northern Transvaal later on. Three were never found. But there was anecdotal evidence that they had been given as a presence to King Mzilikatsi. But a present for me. Lots of things to talk about there. And in fact, Two of those three children kept on coming up in little excerpts of historical uh, record. One was called Sarah, and the other one became an Nduna in Mzilikatsi's impi, and his name was Uvelani, the one who came to us. But Uvelani must at some time have argued with Mzilikatsi and records show that he was killed by anecdotal records because once somebody is killed then the oral history does not mention them again so there's no more known about Uvelani but he is there in certain contexts his sister however was a very different kettle of fish that was Sarah she was given to the last wife of King Zilikazi and she was a high-born Swazi princess. Now, some say 
she acted as a big sister to Logan Gula. But I would think, realistically, she was more of a slave to his mother. At that stage, he was known as Jandu, and Sarah would take him into the Matopos to visit the Mlimo so that he could learn everything the Mlimo could teach him. The Mlimo was the, the wise spiritual advisor to the Matevele people, and he was the one to whom they went to ask for rain, but for a hundred and one other things as well. And Jandu learned and he learned well. In the meantime, Mzilikazi had headed for the Zambezi. His uncle, Godwani, had crossed the Limpopo with the bulk of the Matabele people and formed Bulawayo. His Zwangendaba tribe, uh, Zwangendaba army, had vanquished the Changwamira, or what was left of the Changwamira's te territory, of the Shonas, and they'd established themselves in Bulawayo very happily for about two years. But there was one problem. Nobody had heard from Mzilikatsi. And for two years, nothing. So they thought, well, he must be dead. No, there was a huge problem there because the king had to be at the Inkwala every year, which was the time when the spear would be thrown to say the direction where the next raid would take place and where blessings would be asked upon the crops. A little like a harvest festival as we would know it. Well, Zilikazi was not. He was elsewhere. So what happened from there was that he came storming back to try and work out what on earth was going on. And in the meantime, they realised he was going to be extremely angry. Again, anecdotal evidence, but that Sarah hid little Jandu, the future Lobangula, in the Matopas. His mother was thrown off in Tabazunduna, as was every other relative of Nzilikazi, except for one, the eldest son, Nkuluman, who could not be found. So, there they were, they had to get used to it. So Jandu was never really accepted back in Mzilikazi's territory. There's anecdotal evidence to say, yes, maybe he was allowed on the fringes, but it's been hard to really determine whether he was ever fully allowed. And the fact that when Mzilikazi died, he left no heir speaks volumes. But before we leave Mzilikazi, he was an extraordinary man who ran a disciplined nation, no question. In our eyes, very savage, but at the time, absolutely what was happening. He asked Moffat to come and see him in Matabeleland because he was ill and old. And this writing from Moffat describes it beautifully. He had just reached the Bulawayo, the the capital in Bulawayo, and had been admitted. On turning round, there he sat. How changed! The vigorous, active, and nimble chief of the Matebele, now aged, sitting on a skin, lame in his feet, unable to walk or even to stand. I entered. He grasped my hand, gave one earnest look, and drew his mantle over his face. It would have been an awful sight for his people to see the hero of a hundred fights in such a state. He spoke not except to pronounce my name, Moshete, Moshete, again and again. He looked at me, his hand still holding mine, and he again covered his face. My heart yearned with compassion for this man and for his soul. I'm nearly in tears listening to the brilliant way he describes it, said Carol. Angus went on with the story. The king was suffering from dropsy. Now, before you ask, Carol, that is known as edema today, swelling of the tissues, probably due to some form of congestive heart failure. 
Moffat was able to bring him enough relief for him to not only walk about easily, but to make a long trip with Moffat further north towards the Makalolo region again, where they left supplies for Moffat's son-in-law, David Livingstone. So an enduring friendship between Moffat and Musilikatsi. And of all that time of Musilikatsi, perhaps he did make one critical error. Unlike he had done throughout the Northern Transvaal, claiming the land as Matabili territory, he never claimed Mashana land. The reason was, apparently, that they were too easy. When he needed more cattle, he just went and took them. So the Matabili's would every so often go off, raid a village in Mashana land, but otherwise leave them be. That proved to be an expensive mistake in the future. I hope you've enjoyed it. Next week we'll look at uh, Jandu, what happened to him, what happened to Nkulaman, and what happened to some of those extraordinary people like Courtney Salou. Where does he fit into the picture? Where does Ryder Haggard and King Solomon's Mines fit into the picture? A whole lot were there at one time or another. It's been great to be with you. I hope you've enjoyed it. See you next week.